Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kamar Roche and I'm here presenting with you this study that we're calling Moving Pictures. This is actually our third one in the study so far. Um, and I want to just start out by reminding you of what this study exists for. You, you may have heard the phrase, the idea, the concept in your life, the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words. Th this, this concept is meant to convey the idea that, that if I have something in front of me, if I have an actual image in front of me, I can get so many different stories from this one picture, this one image. But we're also looking at the idea that an image that moves, it can change your life. If you have something that is moving you on the inside, just like movies on the outside, an image that's moving, like you might see me right now and, and, and be moved by the image of me and hopefully not out of fear of my face, but you're moved, right, because there's something more engaging you. The same thing can happen with an image in our mind and in our heart. That if that image moves us on the inside, it will change us. And so we're looking in Scripture, we're looking at the images that God presents to us in the Bible and in the world, and these images that can move us as we understand deeper truths, deeper knowledge to be embraced and grasped and understood in his kingdom. And today we're going to look at the concept of salt. Salt is a very, very, very important image that we have in God's word. And we're going to start out looking at a time when Jesus mentioned the idea of salt. In Luke chapter 14, he says here, he says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus is saying, look, salt, important. Salt, it matters. Salt means something. And it better be salty salt. That may sound like bad English or, or being special or weird or something. But this is what Jesus is saying. This salt had better be salty. But I, I guess the, the place to start, really, and, and the place where I start when I see something like this is I ask myself, you know, and maybe you've asked this too, where does salt come from? I don't know if you've ever asked that. I don't know if you've ever thought and realized that it has to come from somewhere. Just like the, 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 the steak I'm eating or if I'm having some, a piece of banana or something like that, anything else that I'm eating, anything I'm consuming, it comes from somewhere, right? Uh, it's kind of like the joke we were sitting down at dinner one time, my wife, myself, and, and my, my mom and dad, and, and we were sitting there, and my mom was remarking about how many children we have. We have six children, uh, one adopted, five biological and my mother was remarking at the time, I think we only had, you know, I think the fifth one was on the way. The fifth biological child was on the way at the time. And mom's remarking about how we have all these kids. And my wife and I would joke like, ah, we don't know where these things come from. They just keep showing up. And my mom was like, oh, they come from somewhere. Do you want me to draw you a diagram? We're like, no, 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 no. We understand. Yes, yes, these kids come from somewhere. Everything comes from somewhere. Salt comes from somewhere. Have you ever asked yourself, where does salt come from? Because it has an origin. The thing is that salt tends to come from salt mines. In particular, when we're talking about the world when Jesus was preaching and teaching and walking the earth, right, the way they got their salt oftentimes were from places like you see here. These, these salt farms almost. They would let in the ocean water. They would, they would fill up these, these, these caverns, fill up these, 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 these short, shallow areas. They let the water fill it up. Then the sun hits it and heats it and slowly evaporates away the water, leaving behind the salt. This is found not just in the Mediterranean. You can find this in the middle of desert areas where there used to be seas, there used to be oceans, but now it's just salt. You, you find this even way up high in mountains where they can sit there and they can mine salt for generations, for thousands of years even. We have salt mines that have been in operation in some places because where there used to be water there or maybe there's a spring underground and majority of the salt in the world that we consume, it comes from water sources. It comes from water that is salty, evaporating, leaving behind the salt. This is the natural way that it comes about. The natural way it exists is from the water moving, the water moving, being shown on by the power of the sun, revealing salt. And in the end, the end result, piles and piles of this thing that is vital and important to life. And salt can be used for a lot of different things. I know here in, in Kentucky we have it where sometimes it might snow. We don't get much snow. If you happen to live in a colder climate, you might say Kentucky doesn't know snow. Well, <laughs> we think we do. And when we know we have some snow or ice coming, we'll throw salt down on the roads. They used to do the same thing back in ancient Rome. Salt the roads, and okay, that will help to take care of, of all that ice and, and melt it for you. Or you have salt in your food because you need salt to survive. You can, you can put salt into the fields to actually to help deal with pest control and things like that. Salt has all kinds of uses. But our question today is, now that we know where it comes from, is what does salt mean in God's word? 
Well, Leviticus 2.13 says here, it says, You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Did you know that every time an offering was offered on the altar of God, there was salt in it? You might not know that. It's right there in Scripture. It's one of those things that you might miss. This is, just as a side note, if you have not read through the whole Bible, read the whole Bible. A book like Leviticus is oftentimes overlooked because it's just, oh, it's a bunch of list of rules. Who wants to read all these rules? Well, if you don't ever bother to see what God took the time to reveal in all of his word, you're going to miss something important. You're not going to understand what salt means to God if you don't see what salt means to God. And he said, I want this salt with every offering. Spurgeon, great theologian, preacher, man of God, he had this to say on Leviticus 2.13 and the idea of salt. He said that salt is the symbol of the covenant. Salt is the token of communion. Salt is the emblem of sincerity, and salt is the type of purifying power. He said when he looks and sees how God talks about salt being used on the altar, being used in the sacrifices, being used in the community, being used amongst individuals, that what he sees is salt has all these important roles in the kingdom of God. And in fact, you can look at it this way. There's the sign of the salt. If you look in scripture, you can see a number of different signs of the salt. Take, for example, 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Just, just this one verse. And it says here, it says, Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? That this friendship he had, and you go on further in Chronicles, you find about the usefulness of salt in, in medicine as well, in healing and tending wounds, that this friendship between David and God was a covenant of salt. That a real, true binding and healing and, and combining of souls and friendship, he calls it a covenant of salt. But then you also see this in, in Exodus 30. Exodus 30, 31. He says here, he says, and you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on the body of an ordinary person. You shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it or whoever puts any of it on an outsider shall be cut off from his people. And what he's describing here is this special oil and incense before his altar. This be burned at all times. This incense. And when you go back up in the list and you see all these things, this idea of, well, I've got to have myrrh. I've got to have cinnamon. I gotta have aromatic cane, I gotta have cassia, and I gotta have salt. That is gonna be on the altar before my God. And then in Ezekiel 16:4, you have this time when Ezekiel is talking about what happens, that, that this baby that is born, it wasn't even rubbed. Rubbed with what? Rubbed with salt. That that's what they used to do to the newborn baby. That, that the sign of new life that they would rub it with this salt to make it. Know that it is in the world to cover it with this healing property, this, this almost holy thing that would keep them, and protect them, and cover them. This sign of salt. So many things it represents. And so what does salt mean to Jesus and his audience? Because if, if they're sitting there hearing this, we've said this in the other studies as well, right? We want to know what Jesus was intending to be heard when he said what he said. What did he mean for them to heal, to hear, rather, when, when, when they heard him say these words? What did salt mean to them? Well, one thing it meant is without salt, there is no sacrifice. He's sitting there and telling them that I expect you to be salt. Okay. Huh. Interesting. God expects me to be salt. And he says that you can't bring anything before his presence in the Holy of Holies, as a sacrifice, into his temple, before him, it doesn't have salt in it. So you mean to tell me that without me, as his child, as a believer, as one who is walking in the way of Christ Jesus, that without me, he can't even begin to accept a sacrifice? Wow. Here's what else it means to them. Covering with salt brings health. Life. Ah, so, so Jesus, when you say that, that, that we are to be salt and, and we're, to have to, we're supposed to be salty salt, 
not just any old salt, but salt with some, with some kick to it. Um, that, that, that by being there, we're going to bring health and life to the people. And I say kick to it. I was thinking about it when I was down in, in, in Chiapas a few years back. Um, and and I, we were getting coffee in the morning. And, and one of the brothers there, he was like, like hey, you got to try this kind of coffee. What kind? He's like, and he would say, and he would do this motion. He's like, it's, it's, it's cafe encargada. And he would always do this, this motion with it because it meant, it meant charged. And, and I tell you this, that coffee had a kick to it. It was, it, there was coffee, and then there was coffee with, you know, that extra charge to it. And, and what God is saying is that, listen, you're supposed to be that salt, that covering, and you're going to bring that, that extra something because you're salty salt. And so the life you bring is going to be something different. It's going to be something special, something unique, something that people won't see anywhere else. Well, here's what else Jesus is telling us. Sharing salt unites the divided. In the ancient world, and even still to some places in the Middle East, there's a custom that, that if I'm in a community with somebody um, and they share their salt with me, we're now brothers. That, that the mere act of them sharing this precious thing, this thing that you need to be alive, this thing you need to be healthy, this thing that you need to be whole, when they share that with me, we are now united. God talks about this right with this idea of the salt covenant, that David was united with God in covenant through the covenant of salt. That this sharing is what unites the divided. So, oh, okay. So, Jesus, when you say we're supposed to be salty salt, not just any old salt, that we are going to be the thing that brings people together. That when people see us, the divisions that wouldn't normally exist in the world should disappear because salt is there. And when salt shows up, the divide is gone. I was thinking of another example we have um, within the chemical world. If you've ever sat there and said, I'm going to make a, a, a salad dressing from scratch. Okay, well, you have your vinegary component, which is kind of water-based, and you have your oil, and that's great. But the two don't like to mix. Give me some salt in there. And down even at the chemical level, salt makes it so that the water and the oil can actually be closer together and even intermingle. Because of what salt does down at a chemical level. Because salt, sharing of salt, unites the divided. That's what it does. That's what it can do. That's what it should do if it is salty salt. And we also see that giving salt recognizes quality of service. See, in the ancient Roman world, oftentimes salt would be used to actually pay somebody their wages. Uh, uh, you might have heard this, the phrase, uh, we say this in, in English oftentimes, of, you know, th they're not worth their salt, meaning that, that they're not worth what we would pay them to be. In fact, this is so much so, this idea of salt being tied with payment, being tied with what you receive, being tied with salary. That's actually where the word salary comes from. Salary comes from the original Latin word for salt, sal, and it just means your salt. Your salary is your salt because sal salt is that important. Giving of salt recognizes the quality of service. And so, okay, that, that means then that um, me, as the salt that God brings into this world, that God shares in this world, that God saves and calls to this world, I am the thing that's going to determine the quality world I find myself in. Unfortunately, many times I have encountered individuals that don't associate Christianity with quality. Where they look at us and they think that we're just a bunch of people who don't think things through. Um, we just fly by the seat of our pants. We're not, we're not ever trying to live to a certain standard or establish a certain standard. No, 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 because you know we're those Christian folks and we just do things all willy-nilly. But that's not what we're to be. We're to be salt. We're to be that thing that is the distinguishing quality of service. And our presence should be a recognition of quality. Here's the, here's the, the interesting, scary thing. Jesus says in Mark 9, 50, salt is good, but the salt has lost its saltiness. How will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. 
See, the Gospels, it's great, but you might find something mentioned more than once. Um, and, and, and I say this as a parent. When I say something multiple times to my children, it's because it's important. If I say it to them one time, two times, maybe three times, it might not be that big of a deal. But if I say it to them over and over and over again, it's because it's an important concept that I want them to grasp. I need them to understand this. And God says from beginning to end, this idea of salt. We find salt in Genesis, and we find salt essentially in Revelation. Well, how so? Remember that incense we talked about being burnt before his altar? Remember that sacrifice we talked about? That holy of holies just represents what we encounter in Revelation, in his throne room, where the incense is going, where the offerings are representing. And so from beginning to end, the, the thing that salt represents is supposed to be there. And it's supposed to have a certain quality to it. See, Jesus says elsewhere, look, if your salt isn't quality salt, I got a use for it. Throw it out on the roads. Let's just stomp on it. And then it can even be salt that's not even good for that. Here's the thing. The majority of the salt that we produce in the modern world is not consumed. It's not eaten by people or even by animals. It goes into industrial uses. I don't know if you knew this, but to make plastic requires salt. Most of the salt that gets used up in the world to this day is used in industry, is used in manufacturing. We use it to drive the processes that it takes to just make the world work. So think about that. To be such a low-quality salt, you're not even good enough for the roads. You're just going to be used in making some plastic. And what Jesus wants us to, to ask ourselves, what God wants us to see as he talks about salt is, well, hey, all salt is not equal. There is salt that I would put on my table for my wife and I to, to have as a meal with the children. There's salt that I might use when I'm making a special meal. You know, I'm going to use a high-quality salt. I'm going to use something even better than normal. Or, or there's salt that I'm going to throw on our, our walkways when it's going to ice over so that we don't you know, trip and fall and slip up and, and get hurt. Maybe there's salt that I would... Be saying, oh, you know what, son, here, let's throw that into, into our garden over there. We need to affect the pH balance of the soil a little bit. Let's throw some salt out there because it's good. It's only good for the, for the plants. It's not even good for us to step on that salt. We don't want to accidentally track that in the house. And then there's salt that's only good for, well, we can make some plastic with it. We can, you know, use it in some manufacturing industries where nobody will ever see it or taste it or smell it. Salt's good for that. But that's the low-quality salt. All salt is not equal. It's still salt, but it's not equal. And when Jesus talks about, you know, being a, a salty salt, as it were, of having a sincere saltiness to you, this is what he's talking about. And that then brings us to the question, what kind of salt are you? See, I have this picture here of all these different kinds of salt. And, and, I, and I limited it because, I mean, as I was looking for pictures, they, apparently there's purple salt and blue salt. I don't know what they did to make it that color. I don't know why it's that color. But there's all kinds of salt. Look at this right here. This is all salt. Look at all these different kinds of salt. I have no idea what to call them all. God knows what to call them all. There's somebody out there who's probably a chef, you know, five-star chef, and they look at that and be like, oh, okay, well, I'd use that salt for this kind of recipe and, and this salt for that and this one. I have no idea, but I know each one of them has a different quality, has a different purpose, a different flavor, a different balance they might bring to a meal or a dish. What kind of salt are you? Now, I'm not saying this to make you sit there and say, oh, man, I'm road salt. That means I'm trash. I'm not saying that because I don't think that's what God intends when he talks about the different uses of salt. Now, it is true that you can lose your saltiness, it seems. And, and, I, and I challenge you not to become that kind of a salt, a salt that has lost its utility. But if you've ever tried to drive in the winters here in northern America, in the parts to get ice and snow and hail and sleet, I guarantee you, you would never think road salt is useless. It's very useful. It saves lives. It makes society able to continue to function despite the snow. But I'll tell you this. If road salt tried to be table salt, people would die. Road salt will kill you if you eat it. It's different. It's not meant for that. 
Likewise, if I took my table salt and I said, I'm going to solve the problem of my ice to over sidewalk with my table salt, I mean, it might work a little bit, but it's not going to do the job. It's the wrong kind of salt. See, you need to be salty salt, yes. And then you also need it to be the kind of salt that God means you to be in the place God means for that salt to be. Don't be the salt you're not meant to be. Be the salt you were made to be. But make sure you stay salty in that way. And so, in this idea of moving pictures, we've come to a place where we understand that pictures aren't always like we might have thought. Maybe you thought going into this study that, oh, okay, we're going to look at a bunch of different Bible verses, and Kamara's going to take me through all these verses, and I'm going to really, really know Scripture well. And I, and I hope that you are learning Scripture better. I hope that you're understanding God's Word better. But the, the goal of this study is not just for you to read God's Word and see what He means and walk away filled up with some knowledge. But rather to start to see that these images that move us they're not just images in the word of God. See, God is the God of all creation. The same God who sent the Holy Spirit to inspire the men who wrote our scriptures is the same God who spoke all of the universe into being, who sustains everything by the power of his word. And it's the same God who makes sure that each and every one of these truths he speaks to in his word is also seen in the world. And as we spend our time looking at these images that move, the desire is to get you to a place where the Holy Spirit can indeed move in you and reveal to you the reality of God's kingdom. That as you sit and you prepare to have a meal with your loved one and you see that salt on the table, that you'll realize that Jesus talked about salt. Je Jesus talked about me being salt. Jesus talked about me being in the world, and, and not necessarily of the world, but in the world. And, and as I go and I grab this salt and I add it to my meal, um, I need to think about all the things Jesus said about salt and ask myself, am I being that way in my life? A am, am I being salty like this salt is? Or have I lost my saltiness? Am I, am I in the place where he meant for me to be? Or am I not? Do I even know what kind of salt I am? Do I know what kind of salt I am? Or am I just going through life and pretending like it doesn't matter. See, the idea is that maybe by spending time looking at these moving pictures, these images will move you, change you, open your eyes to see just how moving everything around us is. That in reality, we are surrounded by moving pictures. And that as Jesus said, if we only had ears to hear, we would hear all of creation I realize we have one more study to go in this, but I, I feel compelled um, right now that before we go to, to just pray over you. So join with me in prayer. Father God, this is, a, this is a study, this series rather is a series of studies that could really go south. It'd be very easy to take this and turn it into a matter of look at these cool pictures I have and these wonderful antidotes and to lose sight of the word of God. So I pray, God, that that is not what's happening. I pray that nobody is seeing and hearing and being led astray. I pray that it's not becoming about, about the teacher, but rather about the one who provides the teacher. And by that, I mean you, God. God, I pray that in this time that we are having our eyes open to the reality of the truth, that you have surrounded us with images that move, with pictures that you placed in our lives to unveil for us the reality of who you are and who you would have us be. God, I pray that, that you are making us into a people who are truly abiding in the vine. That you are making us a people who take sin seriously for the thing that it is. And that you are making us a truly salty salt in your inventory use for your kingdom. Father, we pray this.